Yeah, so basically, uh, I want to talk about a very hot topic at the moment, and we have only 40 minutes, so better start. Uh, I'm going to talk about a tool set that I've been using for the last year and a half called Nix, um, and how it applies to the whole stack of uh, packaging development and deployment. Um, basically, packaging in Python, we all know it's a quite a depressing topic, but it's getting better. And one of the main things that I really, really, really hate about it is that we have this setup.py that is dynamic. And whatever you do, you have to run this dynamic script, at, at least run the egg info command to get something out of it. And that's why, for example, we don't have uh, dependencies on the PyPy and so on and so on. And for example, Node.js community has this JSON, simple JSON file that is static. You write it down and, and you can easily parse packages and do stuff with it. But there is hope. There is the PEP 426 metadata 2.0, which specifies basically the JSON metadata for packaging. And hopefully, people will then generate this file, put it into a distribution with, with the Python source, and we will have static uh, metadata available. Uh, it's in the draft mode, so who knows when, when this will get upstream. But yeah, there is hope. Uh, and the second point is we have a lot of legacy infrastructure which is kind of connected to this setup.py, but uh, there is now Python Packaging Authority group that's working on this and all the contributors. And I think they really deserve an applause for their work. And then there is this scary third part of, of the problem, and those are non-Python dependencies. And this is, this is the problem that every community tries to solve by you know, building an infrastructure to package all the other stuff that not just Python. And we all share this uh, goal. But maybe, maybe it's time you know, to, to, to look out and uh, find, take something else. You know? um, nowadays, JavaScript stack is basically inevitable. You, can, you have always JavaScript stack in your tool set. And you know, we can either build all the, the, the tools in Python to process JavaScript dependencies and so on and so on, or we can take the JavaScript uh, tool set that they use. Um, but then we need a tool that will actually package Python and JavaScript, right, for our application, and there may, might be even other things. So, so Nick's project was uh, basically started 11 years ago, uh, and it was uh, developed by Elko Dostra as part of his PhD, and the PhD talks about dependency hell and, and how to approach that. And it was done in a university in Utrecht, in Holland, in a functional language department. So the idea is to take functional, language, functional model thinking and apply it to the packaging problem. Uh, and it turns out it it's really, really, really fits uh, the problem. Um, so basically, Nix is two things. It's a package manager, and it's also the language, which we also call Nix expressions. Um, it's a very minimal language. It's basically a configuration files plus lambda functions and a little bit, little bit of uh, other stuff. Uh, it's lazy evaluated. That's something that we're kind of not used in the Python community that much. And you have to get used to the whole thing that when you actually something is actually touched, then it's actually evaluated. And that gives it a really a lot of power for a configuration, which I will show a little bit later. Uh, it's a standalone package manager. You can install it on, on, on any POS6 uh, system. The official support we have for Linux, Mac, and FreeBSD. Uh, there could be, it could work on Windows if a company will sponsor that work, but currently it's, the, the support is basically discontinued. Um, yeah, this is. So, so, what is a purely functional language? I'll give a very vague description in, in sense of the software. Uh, package. So basically, the software package should be output of a function that is deterministic. And it only depends on the functional inputs without any side effects. So when we describe the packages in Nix, the, the metadata that we put on those files, that's the only thing that should affect uh, the package and not, nothing else. Um, and we, we call this purity in Nix. Um, so there you see for an example package. Uh, this is the prefix where the package would get installed. So slash nix store is like a flat repository of all the packages. 
And then you see the cryptographic hash as H1 and, and then the name of the package and the version. <laughs> so every package is stored in this separate folder. Um, and because we want this result, the output to be, uh, to be deterministic, we want to make it immutable so the whole Nick story is mounted as read only just to be sure that nobody will touch it. And all the timestamps are set to Unix uh, daytime pl uh, plus one and so on and so on. Um, and this, this hash that you see there is basically the hash of all the inputs. So if, if, we, if this theory works that it's the, the result should depend only on the inputs, then if we hash it, then we can uniquely identify a package. Um, so, so this is, uh, can you actually see this? It's a little bit, I hope you can see it. But this is like an example Nginx package, how we would package Nginx. It's a little bit simplified at what we ha currently have in the repositories. So at the top you see this is an anonymous lambda function. Uh, it gets high order functions. So uh, they are, those are just another function that's passed in. Um, and then we call the standard environment make derivation, which is the main, the main uh, function that does all the heavy lifting. And in there you basically see it's like a, we call it attribute sets in X, but this is basically a dictionary. And we pass it name, version, and then we tell it where to go to download the sources. Uh, we tell the dependencies, which is called build inputs, some configure flags, and then some just description about the, uh, the package. Um, and, this, and then all this is basically passed to, to a bash script that goes through different phases and it knows what to do with this metadata. And what you see here, this is basically that's what gets hashed. These are all the inputs to build N Nginx. This is all the information we need. And of course, there is a dependency graph of the, of, of the packages, so OpenSSL, Zlib, and so on and so on, uh, are also written in this uh, Nginx. So this is like a quick example of how, how powerful Nix is. Uh, if you look, if we go a little bit back, if you look at, uh, of this, uh, at this uh, file, we, we want to override two things, basically. The, the lambda function at the top and uh, the metadata by the package. So we want to give a user of, of this distribution or uh, package repository the power to, to change anything. So the, the, top, the top line basically overrides uh, the, the lambda function with something new. What? Oh, it's probably fell asleep. Uh, yeah. um, so basically, it overrides the, the lambda function, and we can we can say, okay, let's let's take another open SSL and feed it into, and then we get the new Nginx package with with a different open SSL version. Um, and we can override the derivation itself, and for example, at the bottom. Uh, Example, I have, I override the source and we can, for example, take Nginx from Git. Um, and this, this is what you can do in the user space, right? Um, because sometimes you, you change, have to change what the upstream does. So, so to install Nix on your distribution, this is like a, I mean, this, from security point of view, people will like go crazy, but you can download the script and see it's not doing that much and you can run it yourself. But basically, this is the easiest way to install it. And because everything is stored uh, under slash nix, you can just remove slash nix and you don't have your package manager anymore. And you also have to remove the, the profile in your, in your, for your user. Okay, so, so this, is, this is basically where, where everything comes together and there's a lot of things to explain around how the nix works. So, okay, we said that we have slash nix slash store and inside there are the packages and you can see version and Firefox. So somehow we need to get this file system here, here that we're used to nowadays, right? And that basically is then joined together into a user environment, which you can see on the right. Um, and this is, this is basically your environment where all the binaries are, libraries are stored and under slash bin, slash lib and so on. Um, and because we have this uh, set of packages, wouldn't it be cool that we can have multiple of those, not just one on the system? So this is what we have uh, so-called profiles in Nix. Like the, we have then, uh, I will talk later about NixOS, which is distribution built on top of the package manager. And we have a system profile there, there which is basically your distribution. But then each user gets a profile and you can, you can create profiles on the ply per project. And 
uh, each profile has its own life cycle of how you install packages inside and upgrade and, and delete them and uninstall them. Um, and, um, and basically then the, the profile also has a whole history of what, what's changed. So basically, uh, when you install a package, the, you would get a new user environment with that binary inside, and the profile would get like an, another version number uh, in the history. And basically, the, the last thing that you actually do something to the package manager is that symlink uh, nix var nix profile default will then, at, at the end of all operation, change to the new user environment. And because symlinks are atomic in, in, in uh, POSIX, that means that we have uh, atomic operations of installing, uh, upgrading, and uh, uninstalling packages. And then you see, on the left you see that each user then yeah, has its own profile, and that means that users without root uh, access, they can install packages for themselves. Of course, you can disable this if you want, um, and so on. Um, so one of the really cool features is that uh, Nix uh, is source and binary based collection of packages. This is very unique, and the way that this is actually works is that we have a so-called build farm called Hydra, uh, and we build all the packages, about, uh, all the packages there. And basically, the, because the hash basically provides the, uh, basically uniquely, uniquely identifies the package, you can go ask the Hydra server, oh, do you have a package with this hash? And if Hydra has this package, it will fetch the binary, and if not, it will go and compile it. Um, and this is something that companies de then use to, to, to um, set up Hydra at their own uh, servers and have their own, like, basically, uh, continuous integration tool for, for building the packages. Um, and there is now, all in the Nix 1.7, I think, there is also support for SSH, so you can do the same thing through the SSH protocol, not only HTTP. So just... I don't know if this is going to work, but let's try it out. Mm. Yeah, it's a little bit, yeah. Um. So basically, like, this is Nix, so it's a little bit different than if you only use Nix, but like my Vim binary then points to the Vim, uh, to the Vim uh, binary that is stored inside the Nix store. Well, let, let me show you Nick's store. Just how did you see that there is a bunch of stuff in there? So yeah, this is this is the whole thing. Um, and for example, if we look at the if we look at the linker of Vim, you will see that all the dynamic libraries point to precisely one package in the Nick store, and that makes it very deterministic. You you know for sure that if you build this on two different machines you will get the same result if you use the same source of Nix packages. So, right, let's talk about Python. <laughs> of course, we have also a collection of Python packages, and we, we, we have, this, have this function called build Python package, which is basically a, a wrapper around make derivation that knows about uh, these two tools and setup tools. Uh, and it works a little bit uh, quite the same than, than the make derivation. Uh, and this is like, for example, how you would package pillow, provide the dependencies, source, metadata, and uh, build Python package will know how to run the setup pi build and then set up pi install at the right phases. Um, you can s check inside the Nix packages repository how it works. It's just like 200 lines for the whole implementation. So, so when you have a lot of packages, for example, um, I also do clone development, and we have like 250 packages. Um, you don't want to do it by your hand. Uh, so there are basically two, two tools for this. Uh, Python to Nix is basically just uh, goes there, grabs the tarball, gets the hash, and splits out a template uh, that is very generic. And if there is something really like non-Python dependencies, then you will have to fix that on your own. And there is this cool tool called pipe to Nix, which will also be we will be working on uh, during the sprints. There's quite a lot of Nix developers uh, here um, that tries to handle all the edge cases and automatically basically fetch uh, packages from PyP and then generate these Nix packages uh, for you. 
Um, and we have these tools for Node, we have uh, Node Genix, and, and we have R, and so on and so on. Right, so that's, that's packaging. Let's move to development, right? So wouldn't it be cool if we had a tool like virtual environment, but on the, lev on the, on the layer of the package manager, not just for Python software? Uh, so you would activate environment and you would get like uh, Git and all the other non-Python um, basically dependencies and tools available. And that's what Nick Shell does. Um, so basically how Nick Shell works is that it will build all the dependencies of your package. It will source uh, mm -hmm. all the information it has about those. And instead of actually go and building this package, it will get you into this shell that it's in the shell that it would actually build the package, so you have everything there available. Um, and there is a cool, well, not really a hack, because it's also meant to use this way, but there is a cool feature that you can say that you're not building any package, you set source to null, and then you just provide the build inputs, and you say nick shell, and you will get these dependencies available in your shell, uh, for example. And in this, right, this works on, on a POIX system, so this POSIX system, so you can give this to developers, and they will get always the same uh, environment with the same gits, and, and so on, and so on. There is also a flag called, uh, called pure, so by default, Nick Shell will inherit your current environment and you will have all the tools available. And pure basically means that it will not do that. It, you will have only the tools available that you list in the build inputs. Um, so let's... I'm sorry for the... I hope you still see something. So this is basically... Uh, activated Nick Shell. I mean, I, I did this before on my laptop, otherwise it would go and download those packages from, from Hydra, but the network here is a bit flaky. So basically now I have uh, Git available. Uh, well, let me just see that file. Yeah, so now I have Git available, and if I do pure here and then Git, it will say it's not available because it will not inherit it. Um, and uh, this is one way to, to make sure that you have all the tools in your Nick shell. Um, so the same thing goes. This is I use this uh, this uh, trick to actually install uh, Media Core on CentOS because I just didn't want to bother with Python there. So I just use the whole Nick stack. Uh, stack of packages and use Nick shell and then I have everything available and run virtual env install and that's it. Um, so the same goes if you have a Python package. Basically, all right. So this is, for example, uh, a Python package mm -hmm. of, um, uh, this is one project that I did, like I have GStreamer in there, Dbus, uh, and all kinds of uh, things that are hard to package uh, normally with Python. And, and there is uh, this cool trick uh, we call, uh, we, have a uh, we have a variable called init shell. So when you actually run the shell, this will be true. And we can act the extra dependencies in this case. And if you only build the package, those dependencies will not get into the derivation. Mm. So, so then, okay, then, okay, we have this set of packages. How could we extend this idea of a functional language to, to the whole operating system and build a distribution on top of it? And it turns out yeah, that, yes, this works really nicely. And when you think of it, like a configuration files are basically just one file, and a software package is a bunch of files. The only difference is that your Linux distribution will package software for you, and the, the configuration files is what you will normally write yourself or change some defaults. Uh, but Nix, Nix is basically the language that we have now, so you can use this language on both sides. Mm. So Nix has uh, basically is a stateless, uh, uh, uses stateless approach to configuration. So for example, in Puppet and, and Chef, they, they have uh, declarative configuration in front, but at the back, basically, they still execute 
a step-by-step -step imperative uh, they check if uh, uh, Nginx is up, and if not, I mean, then it will start it, and so on, and there are a lot of edge cases to cover here. Um, so a lot of errors that you can hit onto. And here, basically, uh, the way it works is uh, if something changes, uh, I will show later uh, an example of how, how to do a system D process. And if any parameter to that system D process changes, then it will know that it has to restart or reload that process. So it all boils down to this data going through these functions in X. And, and when something changes, it will do an update. So here you can see like a minimum configuration and I just like uh, configure a monin um, uh, and uh, you, you would then say NixOS rebuild switch and it, it would activate and get the machine into this state. So, so one of the things that's also good to mention here is that NixOS is basically DevOps from the beginning. You won't go and change some configuration files. By default, you have one file, you specify it, uh, what, is, what do you want your state, uh, machi machine state to be, and you execute it. And then we have a tool that basically does provisioning of, of cloud servers and so on on top of that. Um, so, for example, if we wanted to use Pyramid, uh, which I'm using my uh, day job, basically, you, we would import that default.nix file that we were using before for development, so the, the project is already packaged. But then we would say, package write tests, and we would write the production ini uh, file to nix store. That's write is basically a function that will write uh, configuration files to the nix store. And then we will declaratively uh, specify, okay, we have a process, a systemd process uh, that should start with pyramid being served and pass the production ini file. And for example, if the production ini file changes here, then uh, this hash of will change of this uh, service and it will know it has to reload or restart it and so on. Um, and then, of course, on top of that, we want to use a provisioning tool, right? Um, and this is like the minimum example how to how to then provision Nixos machines. Uh, you install Nixops, you specify, uh, for example, this is a trivial a trivial machine. So we have like a web server uh, running Apache, serving some static files. Uh, this is like the, the physical configuration. And then we have the logical, which is basically where do we want to deploy it. Uh, we say, okay, the backend is virtual box, giving me one gigabyte of memory. And we, then I have like a, a trivial Hetzner um, because Nixop supports like Amazon, uh, Hetzner, uh, and now also Google Compute Engine. It's experimental, but it's... Docker as well. And Docker, yeah. yeah. Um, and then you would say create, the, create this uh, configuration and then deploy it and it would actually provision the virtual box and, and um, you would have Apache running in your virtual box. So uh, I don't really have a demo for this um, because um, it's going to take a while to actually show it, but just to, sh just to show you the whole stack. So when I would actually deploy my projects, then I would have three files, one in default.nix, which is for the, the development and uh, the building of, of this uh, project I'm developing. Example machine, which defines the physical and then uh, the physical um, state of machine and then the virtual box. Okay, and then also the Hitzner, so it's four. Um, and if we look <coughs> at all those files first default, um, it's a little bit stripped, but basically there you have just like build package, my name, sources, current so directory, and dependencies pyramid. Um, And this is, this is, for example, a configuration of machine that would launch a Chromium full screen in kiosk mode and serve the pyramid. So at the top you say, we say, okay, import the package, uh, then enable X server, enable display manager, window manager, et cetera, et cetera. 
and the desktop manager will provide our old command, which is basically wait three seconds and then run Chromium at a local host 8080. Uh, and then uh, lower you see again the configuration of the systemd service uh, for pyramids, very simple example, and at the bottom you see how we define uh, declaratively uh, a, a user called guest that we use for the, for this, um, for the Chromium um, uh, graphical <laughs> interface. Uh, and it's, this is basically then the whole configuration of the machine. Um, so you can see like your package, the package was about 10 lines, this is about, I don't know, uh, 100 lines or something, or 150, and uh, the virtual box uh, is, is like a few lines also. And this is, uh, and this is the whole packaging development and deployment stack that you then use to, to actually, and let's, let's still try to. So now, now it tries to download a basic image and it's, yeah, we can wait for a little while, but uh, I guess there is no point. So basically now it would download first the image and then uh, all the dependencies, uh, configure them, uh, confi launch the virtual box, copy all those Nix uh, store packages inside and then activate and you would get the, the full screen Chrome with, with the Pyramid application running. Uh, we are having the second Nixa sprint in, in Slovenia and Ljubljana, where I'm from, in, from the 23rd to 22nd of August. So that, this is a great opportunity to meet the developers, um, talk to them. The, the core, the Elko also will probably also be there, the core developer. And this is, this is basically the image from the last year. Um, Just two, two uh, shameless plugs. I wrote a blog post uh, a little bit more into detail why, why, why Nixos uh, tries to solve this problem in a little better way than other, other um, solutions. And I had a talk at FOSDEM about uh, Nixos. It was more focused on Nixos, so there is a video on YouTube if you want to watch it. And of course, well, check it out on nixos.org and you're welcome on Freenode to stop by and say hi and meet the community. So questions. Maybe that's the question. Can you line up to the right on the how we view the left to the right side on the wall side of the Um yeah, um, so it looks quite interesting, and I didn't know NixOS before. So it looks like um, my Puppet, my Vagrant, and everything I can throw away and then get Nix, and it all runs out of the box. Why isn't it um, like widely adopted so um, so far? Um, what do you, can you mark out? Uh, what are the differences? What are pros and cons, and so on? So the question is, if why do, why is it not that popular yet? Um, yeah, in comparison to like Vagrant and all the established tools, uh, which are of course very yeah. different, have different DSLs and so on. So of course it would be awesome to have one approach to this kind of problems. Yeah, I mean the short answer would be we need more marketing people. <laughs> the long answer would be that um, actually now for about a year or two we have uh, uh, Nix Ops and a Nix Shell and so on, and now I think finally this is. This stack is ready to be used. And one of the, the biggest two companies is Logic Blocks and Zalora, and they have about 100 servers provisioned with this. Um, and, and the community is really growing. The Haskell community, basically, uh, there were a, a few blog posts in the last few months explaining how people develop Haskell with NixOS, and it went very viral. And I would lo love that the same happens to, to the Python community if we actually want to solve these problems. And I think now it's the time that, you know, this is, we really see a lot of, a lot of new users. Um, you can see that on mailing list, IRC and everywhere. And I hope that we get there. Uh, I hope that we get to the same point. Uh, it looks really interesting. Um, the, you said that it's supported on POSIX. 
systems. Does yeah. that include Mac? Yeah. 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 Cool. We have we have quite a bunch of uh, unhappy Homebrew X users that now use Snicks OS it's for, for their packages. Famous, yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. But we don't have that much FreeBSD uh, users yet. So. Hi. Uh, it's more of a just one thing. Maybe it was not clear what it does. Like, what are the benefits of? It's not a question. It's just this, uh, what I missed from the the talk. What okay. are the benefits uh, of actually using uh, and starting developing uh, Nix, uh, using Nix and uh, with Python? It's uh, you get in our company. We got a development environment which was. We kind of switch to continuous development environment, like not the, only for deployments we use the, this thing, but also for continuous uh, uh, development, right? So each time a developer comes, like in a snap of a finger, you have a development environment ready and no virtualization, right? It's just your system. So it's kind of a lot different way in quickly getting started with new projects. That was a major boost for us. Cool, thanks. Hi, uh, thanks for a great, great talk. I had a few questions. One is that you mentioned briefly binaries. Right. Does, do you provide, uh, like, does Nix itself provide binaries, or do you expect the one wanting to use binaries for deploying stuff with Nix to, like, roll your own uh, binary storage or something? Yeah, so the, the Hydra project, basically, you can host it yourself, and then it will build the binaries of your customized packages or your pro uh, projects in your company and you can point that to the official Hydra and to your Hydra and it will just ask both for binaries and fetch them. Okay, cool. Uh, and another question that came to mind is uh, more like a security related. Okay. Let's say you find, you know, things that would never happen, you find a bug in OpenSSL or something and you get like... <coughs> Like how I'm thinking is like if I run normal like say Debian Ubuntu box, I get the new OpenSSL which has the same ABI compatibility, and the only thing I need to do is just restart my services for them to end up in the same uh, like using the newest version. So how do you? Because I saw that you link specifically to those like a certain versions of software. How do you solve this in Nix? Do you, does it just mean rebuilding everything or? Yeah. So. Um yeah, this is this is one of the problems that we. So basically, yeah, if, if you if you change the open SSL, then Hydra has to recompile all the binaries. This norm, like the last time that was a hole in the open SSL, I think it took like one day or something, uh, and that's of course unacceptable. Um, uh, but we have now an option called uh, I think it's called uh, security updates or something in XOS, and basically t there is a hack around NixOS that it, the hash will not change so you don't have to recompile everything. So you say the original, the original library was open SSL and the new one is open SSL uh, blah 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 and then that will replace all, all the everything that uses this open SSL library and it will not go and rebuild everything that's needed. Um, and that way you can really, uh, really quickly you know, update your server. And because if you're using NixOS it will also know that which which uh, processes were using OpenSSL and go and restart those. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Um, the um, the uh, hash of of, uh, of of your package depends on its inputs. Which is say, so can you be a little bit louder? I mean? Sorry. So the hash for for your package depends on the uh, inputs. Which say for a pure Python package would be um, Python itself. Um, so, so you can rebuild that and get the same version. But is there is there anything that also ties it to the version of um, the Nix toolchain that you used to build it? Because if there was a new feature introduced in the Nix toolchain or something, is there is there a way of basically rebuilding a package of like two years ago or something exactly as it was at that so, time? So, if uh, basically if a Nix uh, upgrades or something. Yeah. Yeah, um, but that's like the whole Nix uh, is upgraded separately. Um, so it doesn't affect the Nix toolchain, but everything else down to the GCC and glib and so on is basically a dependency then of, of your uh, Python up package. I don't, I'm not sure if that answers your question. And so so, so um, I, I believe the Nix toolchain sort of, if you build a binary, will, will change, change the R path or something in, in binaries. 
etc. But if the so so if the if that behavior slightly changes or something like that, can you rebuild? Is is basically the version of the Nix toolchain that are used in a part of that hash, just as a, as its dependencies are? Or is that part of the dependency? I'm not I'm not sure I understand the question. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe ask wait, let, so let's yeah come to me and we can yeah okay. Any more questions? Sorry, I missed in your slides, I missed the version definition when you listed the dependencies. Um, where are they defined? Like, So basically this is kind of like Ubuntu style where the name is, the version is tied to the name. Um, and the name basically, the version is, is, is not important um, in, in Nix at all because that's just basically a metadata. Um, and when when the the Nix packages repository changes, you will just get the, the new package. Uh, and inside there, of course, there is the the version name, but uh, we don't do any like uh, detection or something to, uh, about the versions. But if you sh uh, you showed this Python example, so I want some specific uh, like GStreamer version, and um, it was part of the name. Um, yeah, so so when we have like when you have like GStreamer, which you have version one and the the version before one, then we have basically two packages, okay. uh, and then you can pick uh, which one you want to use, um, and you can always override the source and get uh, another version uh, if you want to change the upstream default um, for your project or server or whatever. What is the difference between uh, Nix and Docker? Uh, <laughs> that's, um, so basically, Docker tries to isolate the environments from your system, right? Uh, and provides a very nice API on top of that. While Nix basically tries to solve the packaging problem and configuration problem. So these are not like, I think those two things go together. You can use Nix OS inside the Docker if you want. Uh, of course, we're also using Docker to solve uh, the packaging problem and providing a huge binary blob, but that's another discussion. And uh, in Nix, you don't have to do this. Uh, you don't have this problem. Uh, but it's still nice to have you know, those lightweight containers and to experiment around that and so on. Uh, that's a very short answer. <laughs> cool. Well, then one think. one question, yeah. just one. Do, do you use Nix in the web development? Because you, you showed a lot of stuff about the uh, OS dependencies and uh, OS package dependencies, and even if Python dependencies. Let's say uh, right now it's for the backend, but in our company uh, we have a lot of struggle of packaging uh, and deploying uh, services with a lot of, let's say, uh, for example, JavaScript with Bower and so on. So how does Nix apply to that? I, I know that you can uh, uh, declare your own sources and it can be JavaScript sources, but uh, do you have any, for example, JavaScript uh, uh, repository and how the, does it apply to the package so that, for example, Python code finds uh, those JavaScript li libraries and so on? Because this is our crucial problem. The Debian, for example, can handle their own dependencies and it's fine. You can do you, your own pi, uh, peep repository and it's fine. But gluing peep and Bower, for example, that's a struggle. And how does Nix apply to that? Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's exactly where Nix shines really good. So we have a tool, Bower to Nix, I think it's called, to generate the Bower packages, uh, to generate Nix packages from Bower upstream in the Nix packages repository. And then you would go in your project, do the same for all the extra stuff that you want. And basically the Nix knows all about, uh, about both sets of packages and you have those available. And then you have all the Python dependencies available. Uh, and then uh, you use the, the make derivation and Nix shell to, to develop on that and it will make it, um, it will expose those packages for you to use. Uh, it's really hard to explain this without an example. Um, but there, are, there is a blog post, if you, if you Google around, you will see uh, 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 how it's used for node packages, for Bower, I don't think it's, but it's the same thing, I mean, it's just the front end. 
Um, and this is exactly where Nix really shines when you have to combine two, two stacks together. Perfect.